Uh, thank you, Mr. President. After the brilliant and inspired speech made by my honourable friend from Christchurch, I rather felt I could go home because the job was done. But as you kindly gave me dinner, I thought that might be rude, so I'd better stay. But in ten minutes, how can I possibly list all those achievements of this amazing government, a government that has done so much for the country and is doing even more, now untied from the shackles of the great Sir Vincent Cable and his friends in the Liberal Democrats? Now, he may sit there looking like a friendly, grandfatherly figure, but in fact, he was an octopus in government who had his tentacles <laughs> strangling fine initiatives and great work that the government was otherwise trying to do. But what have we done? The great task that when we came into government, and yes, it was in coalition, the country was bankrupt. There was no money left. We knew that something had to be done to rescue the nation's finances. And that is never easy, and it is never popular. Saying to people that you're going to take away the punch bowl and end the party always leaves people feeling depressed, saddened. I know you've got some fine party coming up here, being advertised earlier. When the librarian removes the last bottle of gin, you will feel sad and depressed and you'll want more. And that's what Labour was offering, more gin. But they didn't know, <laughs> but they didn't know how to pay for it. And we had to stop that, and we took tough decisions. The Conservative Party took tough decisions to do that. The deficit, 150 billion pounds when we came into office. An economy that was on its knees. Now the deficit, down to about half of what it was, really coming under control, and the third longest period of economic growth since the 1950s that we are at last getting things back on track by making tough decisions. And why those tough decisions were so important was not because we wanted to stop people drinking their gin or alternative spirits. No, <laughs> the reason we did it was because it was the only way to get the economy back to health. That because we were tight on the fiscal settlement, interest rates were allowed to stay low, Quantitative easing could remain in place, and that meant that businesses were able to continue to borrow, that they didn't have banks foreclosing because money was cheap, and even more importantly, individuals were able to stay in their homes and continue to pay their mortgages. So it was of fundamental importance and has led to the growth of this economy that we were tight on the fiscal side, made those hard decisions early on, and allowed the Bank of England to continue with its loose monetary policy, which it still continues. It would be a great pleasure to give away from the, to the distant voice. Where are you? I can hear you, but I can't see you. Someone speaking for God, I think, from the <laughs> nethermost. Why should we have confidence in this government's um, fiscal policy that was resulted in one of the slowest recoveries on record in any recession? The economy has recovered. We went into one of the deepest recessions in our history. And if the honorable gentleman had paid attention to the Office of National Statistics, he would know, you don't tell me a gentleman at Oxford hasn't paid attention to the Office of National Statistics. <laughs> he must be a Cambridge man. Um, <laughs> I, but, but if he had, he would know that the figures were subsequently revised to show that the downturn was even deeper than initially expected and the upturn has been faster than initially um, reported by the Office of National Statistics. Revisions to GDP forecasts have shown actually it's been a pretty good, well-founded and now long-lasting recovery. And look at the rest of the world. Look what's happening in continental Europe where they're shackled by the euro, where they can't recover. The only other country that is doing anything like as well as us is the United States. China is having economic difficulties. Across the emerging markets, Brazil, Russia are having economic difficulties. The UK, thanks to the sheer brilliance of George Osborne, David Cameron, and of course the President of the Board of Trade, Sajid Javid, is seeing a proper, well-founded recovery. And that is why you should have confidence, because let me remind you of a little bit of history. Every time there is a socialist government, every single time, they leave an economic mess which the Conservatives then have to repair. And that makes it easy for them to say popular things, to say nice things, to cheer everyone along. And we have to do the tough, hard work of getting it right. And that's why you should have confidence in us. 
but you should also have confidence in us. As my honourable friend from Christchurch was saying, and as the Prime Minister set out in his speech last week, because of what we fundamentally believe, what makes us conservatives, what makes us conservatives is that we believe that society is built from individuals up, not from the state, from the collective down. And therefore, we think every individual has equal value, is of great importance in the way society is built and formulated, and that those individuals should be as free as possible to lead their lives as they choose, that they should not be directed from Whitehall. It was a Labour cabinet minister who said, though some years ago, but it still underlines their philosophy, that the fact is, the man in Whitehall really does know best. That is the antithesis of what I believe. I believe the man in Whitehall, however clever, even if he's got a double first from Oxford, which a lot of them have, does not know better than the random decisions of millions of people about how to lead their lives. And if we have that real belief, a core to our conservative philosophy, then every British subject, every subject of Her Majesty living in this country is of equal value and the choices they make for themselves are of equal worth, whether they are an immigrant who got their passport yesterday or whether, like me, they're about 3,000 and have lived in the Somerset that time. That, that, that is a fundamental and important principle and it's how we view society growing and being strong and developing. It is trusting the people. And the Honourable Lady from Ealing um, Acton said that the Prime Minister was giving us a referendum on Europe and that was reckless. That's what socialists believe. They can't trust you, ladies and gentlemen. They can't let you vote. They've got to make the decision in Whitehall because that's where all the clever Johnnies are. They know what's best for us. They know with clever Francois over in um, France and clever Fritz in Germany and so on, they know what's best for us. Well, ladies and gentlemen, they don't. You know what is best for you. But I know, I know that I am addressing, and I can say this without sounding sycophantic, some of the finest young brains in this country. You wouldn't be here, you wouldn't have got in if you weren't. And you know that if you have no confidence in this government, you have to have confidence in something. You have to think that there is a government in waiting that is competent, urgent, ready, willing and able to take over running this country. Do you really think that that is there in the Labour Party today? A Labour Party that a fortnight ago was in favour of fiscal responsibility and yesterday was against it? A Labour Party where the policy may or may not be to keep Trident, but the leader of the party said he wouldn't press the button anyway, so we might spend £50 billion in accordance with Labour Party policy for a Prime Minister who won't then press the button, so that's £50 billion down the drain. Loose change for the socialists, I tell you, but for the rest of us, <laughs> quite serious money, but it makes a mockery of their opposition. The Liberal Democrats, I actually feel sorry for the Liberal Democrats, I think they made a very serious contribution at the last government. I think Mr. Clegg is a really important figure in our recent uh, political history and I'm grateful to him for what he did in 2010 when he realised the situation facing the country was so dire that he put his nation before his party. But his party got a large ra raspberry at the last election and is therefore not a force to be reckoned a serious opposition or a government uh, in waiting. They, don't even have enough people in Parliament at the moment to fill the Cabinet, let alone to fill, fill the ministries. We'd have to be run from the House of Lords, where they've got quite a lot of people, which hasn't happened since Lord Salisbury over there uh, was in charge, which is a year or two ago. Um, <laughs> and that leaves just Alex Salmond and our friends in Scotland. Well, you may, you may think that Alex Salmond is the hero of the hour and perhaps the English will be tempted to have a Scots Nats Prime Minister, but I don't think that's very realistic. I don't see you rising up in your kilts. I mean, they're all in black tie this evening, but not many bekilted black tie wearers. So there is no serious opposition. There is nobody challenging the government in the way actually it ought to be challenged, because good opposition leads to good government. There is, to borrow Disraeli's phrase, a range of exhausted volcanoes 
I think some of them were never even volcanoes. It's more like a range of molehills that might occasionally have a little mole peek out and be terrified by the light as he looks out of the top. There is no opposition to have confidence. There is a government that has triumphed against mighty odds, that has taken charge of the deficit, is restoring our freedoms in Europe, is ensuring that the individual is put first and making Britain strong again. We should be proud of that and have confidence in it.